Soumya. And everyone else, of course, who has joined us uh, today, I, on behalf of the Department of English at Jamia, extend a very warm welcome uh, to all of you to the 15th Ahmed Ali Memorial uh, Lecture, which is, of course, to be delivered by Professor Vivek Chibber. Uh, it is such an honor and privilege for us to have Professor Chibber amidst us, and I can't thank him enough for agreeing to deliver uh, the Ahmed Ali Memorial Lecture this year, which is titled The Flight from Materialism. At the end of Professor Chibber's lecture, there will be, with his permission, a question and answer session. Uh, uh, we will also be recording and live streaming his lecture for our audiences and subscribers on uh, YouTube. So before we start, I'm going to ask Sabah, uh, my dear colleague, to honor him uh, with, with what we ritually like to do in India. So <laughs> also known as platitudes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> right. You, would you mind standing? Oh, up? sure. Okay. Oh my goodness. <laughs> there are some cultures in which we would now be married. <laughs> Friends, uh, the Ahmed Ali Memorial Lecture is to honor the enduring legacy of Ahmed Ali, a novelist, poet, playwright, translator, and literary critic. As you all know, Ahmed Ali is a pioneer of modern Urdu short story. And his works include short story collections, Zangare, Hamari Gali, Kaid Khana, and Mot Se Pehle, among others. His other writings include Twilight in Delhi, his much celebrated novel in English. Ahmed Ali was also one of the co-founders of the All India Progressive Writers Movement and contributed immensely to the domain of literary studies. Ahmed Ali has also translated a number of literary works, such as uh, The Flaming Earth, an anthology of in Indonesian poetry, uh, among several others, and as much acclaimed Al-Quran, a contemporary translation is recognized as an exemplary work. On this occasion, as we remember Ahmed Ali's rich legacy, it is only fitting that we have Professor uh, Vivek Chibba de delivering the 15th Ahmed Ali Memorial Lecture on the flight from materialism. Earlier, the department has hosted speakers such as Professor Yor Anantamurti, Shamsur Rehman Farooqi, Professor Irfan Habib, Professor Sir Faisal Devji, among others who have de de delivered the Ahmed Ali Memorial Lectures. We're extremely fortunate today to have with us Professor Chibber, one of the most important intellectuals of our times as our speaker. I'm extremely grateful to Professor Chibber for so generously sharing his time and scholarship with us this afternoon. And now it is my pleasure and privilege to introduce Professor Chibber formally, though he needs no introduction whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Professor Vivek Chibber is professor of, of sociology at New York University. He is the editor of Catalyst, a journal of theory and strategy, and the author of several award-winning books as well, of which the latest are The Class Matrix, Social Theory After the Cultural Turn, which was published in 2022 from Harvard, and Confronting Capitalism, How the World Works and How to Change It, which was published from Verso in 2022. Professor Vivek Chibber is also the author of Postcolonial Theory and the Spectre of Capital, which was published from Verso in 2013, and Locked in Place, State Building and State Industrialization in India, which was published from Princeton in 2003. Professor Chibber's Locked in Place attempted to answer why some countries are able to build developmental states in the decades after World War II, while others were not. He argues that the literature on developmental states had ignored the constraints that class power imposes on state building, particularly the power and influence of domestic capitalists. His critique of post-colonial theory in his second book, Post-Colonial Theory and the Spectre of Capital, is a milestone in contemporary humanities and social science theory. In this critique, mounted chiefly on behalf of the radical enlightenment tradition, Professor Chibber offers the most comprehensive response to post-colonial theory by focusing on the subaltern studies project. He demonstrates that it is possible to affirm a universalizing theory without succumbing to Eurocentrism or reductionism. In the class matrix, Professor Chibber offers a systematic critique of cultural theory and offers a robust defense of materialism. Professor Chibber shows that it is possible to accommodate the main arguments from the cultural turn within a materialist framework. One can agree that the making of meaning plays an important role in social agency, while still recognizing the fundamental power of class structure and class formation. In confronting capitalism, Professor Chibber provides a clear and accessible map of how capitalism works, how it limits the power of working in oppressed people, and how to overcome those limits. I'm so deeply honored and so, so happy and so privileged and so, uh, so happy about the fact that you're here with us, Professor Chibber, and I think this is really a testimony to your scholarship, and we're so grateful that you actually chose to give us so much of your time and, 
uh, you share your scholarship with us. So now, without much ado, I'm not going to stand between them and you. So over to you, Professor Jibber, to deliver the 15th Emily Memorial Lecture. Thank you, Simi. Um, I hope you're all here because, um, as Simi said, you're interested. You might also have come with eggs and tomatoes in your pockets, so um, time will tell. But I must say I I'm uh, very gratified to see the room packed the way it is. Um, the last, you know, I come to India, I've been coming every year for about 30 years, and the last 15 years, twice a year. And it's been depressing to see not only the changes politically, but also intellectually. This was once a country that had probably the most robust Marxist intellectual culture in the global south, and it's largely dead now. If not dead, it's dying. And this is not just because of the attacks from the right. It is because of attacks from what's called, mistakenly, the left, from what's called radical theory, a lot of which I criticized in post-colonial theory in the specter of capital, and some of it was in the class matrix. But the fact is that today, uh, intellectually, it is a very different land than it was arguably for almost half a century, from independence into the middle of the 90s. So it's really gratifying to see people here, I hope, interested in uh, what a Marxian response might be to the flight from materialism, or even a materialist response might be. So I have prepared this talk with two constraints in mind. One is that we only have an hour, which is short for a talk. Um, and the uh, other I is that um, I really want to leave as much time as possible for a conversation, questions and answers. So there might be elements of this talk that seem cryptic, that seem somewhat compressed. I would urge you, for all those uh, parts of the talk that do appear to be somewhat unclear, to demand that I clarify them in the question and answer session, and I'd be more than happy to do so. That said, let's launch into this. And um, hopefully nobody faints from all the overcrowding. <laughs> but if you do, please do it quietly. <laughs> so for decades and decades and decades, Marxists and the socialist tradition more generally, of which Marxism was just a part, was associated with a doctrine known as materialism. Now, this materialism had three different dimensions to it. One was what you might call an ontological or metaphysical materialism. This was the view that there is a reality that is mind independent, that exists independently of our mind, and that's true of both the natural world as well as the social world. Marxists affirmed this proposition. The second is what broadly you might call an epistemological materialism, which was the view that even though ideas mediate our access to reality, the structure of reality imposes limits on the variability of our impressions of the world, which means that even though we might have mistaken views of the world, there is a means to correct them through engagement with it. And hence, an accurate knowledge of reality is possible. Some Marxists have actually been empiricists about this, but the dominant tradition is what we might call a scientific realist tradition. And the third is what you would call a social materialism, which is the view that in social reality, explanations and strategies derive from the assumption that agents are acting on their interests. And in, there's a term called material interests, which is basically shorthand for that is economic interests. So the idea is that there's an objective reality. You can apprehend that reality. And there, our knowledge of the reality is gleaned in the social world through uh, our engagement with it. And there's an empirical proposition that there are certain domains of social action in which economic interests are the overriding motivation for social action. Now, for about 100 to 120 years, Marxists believe in all three of these. And all three have come under attack within Marxism and uh, by non-Marxists over the past 40 to 50 years, especially the last two. Epistemological materialism, there is an overwhelming tendency towards an epistemological relativism over the past 40 years or so. And then, of course, thanks to the cultural turn, the notion that people are motivated by their objective material interests. And this is what I've addressed in my last, uh, the post-colonial book, and also in the class matrix. 
What I want to do in this talk is focus on the third, on social materialism, a defense of that materialism against some of the arguments that have been launched against it in order to show that many of the worries, quite a few which are legitimate, uh, can be accommodated by a robust interest-based theory of social action. Now this social materialism itself has two components to it, a macro and a micro. The macro component is the view that history is governed by economic development. This is the view that Marx propounded in his preface to a critique of political economy, outline a preface to contribution to a critique of political economy. History is governed in law-like fashion by the uh, progressive development of the productive forces. Social relations adjust functionally to the forward march of the productive forces and ideas and ideology in turn are functionally subordinated to the production relations, the class relations that are dominant at a time, which are in turn explained by the level of the productive forces. Now that theory has come under a lot of criticism. I myself have, cr have criticized it as probably being implausible, but it was for the longest time taken for granted by Marxists as one of the instances of materialism. The second kind of social materialism is at a micro level. And that is the view that social agents, individual agents, are motivated by something called their class interests. Now the class interest, by that what we mean is your interests as dictated by your position in the class structure. So in or whatever your position in the class structure is, it generates for you a strategy that will be the most reasonable and the optimal one if you want to uphold your physical well-being, your economic well-being, your location in the class structure uh, filters which kinds of actions will be reasonable and appealing to you and which ones will not. Both of these kinds of social materialisms were also upheld by Marxists, Marxists for the longest time. Of them, while they gave lip service to the macro one, it was really the micro one that did most of the work for socialist organizing, for Marxist theory, and for the Marxist political uh, doctrine as well. For about four to five generations, you see social materialism as being the bedrock for what Marxism was, because out of this comes class theory, and the essence of Marxism is class analysis. The idea that if you want to understand how a society is working, look to the class structure, and if you want to organize in that society for social justice, you have to organize around people's class interests. All right, so it was, there are three payoffs of this kind of micro-level social materialism, this, this what we now call class analysis. It is, first of all, essential for Marxist socialist strategy. This was the basis on which you design a political program. How do you design a program? You say, well, who are we trying to organize? What's the class? Given that class, what sorts of measures and policies and directives would be appealing to it? And then you, through that program, get your cadre, your organizers, to go into the class and try to recruit them into a political movement towards the pursuit of that program. The program is your analysis of what the class interests are of the people who you're trying to organize. Secondly, it was a basis for what we call internationalism. It wasn't just that white people are taken to have similar class interests. It wasn't just that Europeans are taken to be motivated by class interests, but anyone who is in the same position in the class structure, white or black, brown or yellow, Hindu or Muslim, Christian or Jewish. It was a basis of a universalism in the understanding of people's place in the social and political reproduction of society. And then, of course, finally, on the basis of this, you get a political economy. Marxist capital does not anywhere say that it's European or white capitalism that functions the way he describes it. He says capitalism. Wherever you implant capitalist class relations, you will get what he calls these laws of motion, what we would today call the macro dynamics of a society. So we get this incredibly powerful theory based on these micro level assumptions, at the heart of which are two universalisms. Capitalism, wherever it goes, has certain tendencies, dynamics, what he calls laws of motion, which are applicable regardless of place, regardless of culture. 
And secondly, based on the fact that human beings have certain basic needs that are in common, certain basic goals that are in common, you also have a universal resistance to capital on the part of those who are subordinated to it. And with this, you have from the 1890s all the way into the 1970s an international, international socialist and working class movement also bringing in the peasantry in this political milieu. This was the theory that we had for the longest time, and this is the theory from which there has been a retreat over the past 35 to 40 years or so. And the essence, the motivation for that retreat has been the following, which is that in its understanding, in its explication of how capitalism works, Marxism unduly subordinates or minimizes the role of culture. Now, what, what was the basis of this criticism? This theory originates in uh, Western Europe in the 1950s by certain German theorists, some of the practitioners of the Frankfurt School, but primarily by the British New Left. And what motivated the criticism was the observation that a central prediction of Marx appears not to have been borne out by historical events. Now, what was that prediction? It was that, as he famously said in the Co Communist Manifesto, capitalism exploits the proletariat wherever it goes, but by virtue of doing so, also motivates the proletariat to resist through class struggle. And insofar as it resists through class struggle, eventually the proletariat will overthrow the system and bring in its place a socialist system. So as Marx famously says, capitalism creates its own grave diggers. Now for about 30 to 40 years after Marx's death, this seemed to be coming true. You had from 1905 to 19, I would say, all the way to the Spanish Revolution, which is the mid-1930s, you had about a quarter century or so of systematic breakdown of capitalist political regimes in which the working class played the central role. So it certainly looked like the grave diggers were doing their work. But by the first decade after the Second World War, and it's pretty clear that that process has stalled. And Western Europe in particular, and the United States, in the countries where capitalism had developed the most, and where the predictions ought to have been borne out the most vigorously, what you in fact see is an incorporation of the working class into the system, and a decline in the revolutionary fervor that marked working class politics in the first three decades of the century. Now, this appeared to be a puzzle for this incipient, what was called the New Left. And in answering the puzzle, they came to the conclusion that in order to, ex Marx was correct in insisting that there is a contradiction, conflict generated by the class structure, but he wrongly ignored that the working class's willingness to rebel, its understanding of its situation, its ability to come together as a class was profoundly mediated by ideology and culture. So we, they start with this sociological observation that in order to understand how class works, you must understand how culture mediates your access to your place in the class structure. And the class structure will not unilaterally and unidimensionally uh, dictate to you a revolutionary strategy. And from that, they reach the conclusion about agency which is that in our understanding of political and economic agency, you have to put in pride of place culture, ideas, meaning making, discourse, and this is what Marx ignored. So the calling card of the new left. Sorry. Why don't you guys move a little bit to the other side? All of you guys yeah. should, I'm really sorry about this. Movie. It's okay. Move that side. Move that side. You guys please move that side so that more people can come in and then shut the door. Yeah. Why don't you guys move that side? I think if you move in that way, yeah. then it'll be Why less congested. It's, it's so more people can come in. just like being on the metro. <laughs> Don't everybody crowd the door. I'm really sorry. No, no, it's okay. Why don't you shift that? Why don't you shift that, sir? 
popularity you have? <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> All of you guys, please go that side. Why don't you go that side, please? Just move that side. Okay. So, the observation that political agency, economic agency, is mediated by ideology slowly leads to a profound, profoundly new understanding of agency itself at the micro level. It starts with the notion that actors cannot understand their economic position except through discourse and except through local meanings and local ideology. And then it leads to the much more profoundly uh, ambitious claim that ideas don't just mediate our access to reality, but they actually constitute reality itself. They constitute the political subject itself. So now, instead of class structures generating an ideology, generating a particular understanding of the world, which is what traditional materialism insisted upon at the macro level. Now it turns out that meanings and I ideas, in fact, constitute the class and create the class. Class, as famously uh, uh, pointed out by William Sewell, class now becomes an effect of ideas rather than the progenitor of the ideas. Well, this is the, what the flight from materialism ends up being. It ends up being both a new understanding of the macro properties of capitalism where it is the way in which culture incorporates agents, or as Althusser says, interpolates agent, agents that determines the political fortunes of capitalism. And at the micro level, the notion that the very idea of objective interests is folly. Actors' understanding of the structures is generated by their discourse, and therefore their notion of the, their own interests is also created by the discourse. Uh, the irony, of course, here is that this theory reaches its apex, its height of popularity, right when the inexorable, unrelenting pressure of capitalism is spreading across the world remorselessly, and where a kind of univocal logic of the system is imposing itself on social agents. Social theory goes headlong into contingency and locality right when the obdurate force of capitalist relations are crushing people under their weight. Now, my, in the class matrix especially, I have criticized this particular understanding of why the working class was incorporated into capitalism. And what I say in that book is that, and what I said in the previous lecture I gave on YouTube, uh, on Zoom to, to Jamia, was that it is in fact possible to have a materialist explanation for why workers were incorporated into the system, which shows that the primary, the driver of their incorporation was that Marx correctly understood that they would resist capital, but he wrongly assumed that the resistance would take collective form. And which, in fact, the, the character of the capitalist class structure is such that by the way in which it imposes the risks and the costs of collective action onto workers, it does not erase their resistance but it does channel that resistance into manageable forms, primarily making individual resistance more attractive than collective resistance. It is not that collective resistance becomes impossible, but it now becomes a highly contingent affair, which has to be brought about against the baseline inclination of workers to prefer individualized action over collective action. Now the point here is this, that what makes this an argument distinctive is that it draws on the same assumptions about agency and interests that is endemic to classical Marxism. It relies on a materialist understanding of human agency. Now, what I will not, what I want to do in this talk, all this was kind of prefatory, laying out what the, um, what the, the lay of the land is. I do not in this talk want to rehearse my response to the cultural turn with respect to the place of interests and culture. That, a lot of that is up on YouTube and you can read the book. It's, I wrote the book as simply as I could so you can read it in a couple of sittings. It's uh, not that hard to understand. What I do want to do is go deeper into the theory to address some of the anxieties that I've seen, both with the publication of post-colonial theory in the specter of capital and also with the publication of the class matrix. In both of those books, I make reference not only to workers' material interests and to peasants' material interests, but I characterize their pursuit of those interests as rational. 
This word rational throws people into hysterical fits. And I want to address three of the main concerns that they seem to have when they confront this word. I think those concerns are legitimate, but they're misplaced. And in engaging those concerns, I would like to now provide a more robust defense of the micro-foundations of class analysis, primarily Marxian, but also non-Marxist non class analysis also draws from these particular uh, ideas. And in doing so show that the, the uh, traditional Marxian understanding of class is not only able to incorporate culture the way I show in the class matrix, but also many of the other concerns about notions of rationality, notions of material interests, sidelining other facets of human agency and human nature, which the critics have raised. So there are three concerns that come to the fore when, uh, what, that I've seen come to the fore when people uh, read the stuff that I've written. Each of these worries, each of these concerns regards the insistence that people, uh, social agents, pursue courses of action that uphold their economic well-being or their material well-being, and in, in so doing are rational in some loose sense of the word. So the first of these concerns is that the characterization of agents as pursuing their economic ends reduces all human motivation to economic motivation. Whereas, in fact, we know that human beings are, they, they value very many ends. The economic is one of them but they also love, they also have friendships, they're moral agents, they have an ethical concern, they have uh, aesthetic worries, they're multifaceted, and indeed this is what distinguishes them from animals. And the insistence that we put economic concerns at the center of our explanatory agenda does violence to the heterogeneity of human motivations, to the diversity of human motivations. The second concern is that where we say economic agents are concerned with, with, sorry, that social agents are concerned with economic ends, we turn them into hedonists. It's not just that they're concerned with their well-being, but they have these little calculators that they're walking around with, constantly worrying about whether they're getting the most out of every social interaction or not. Once again, this seems to do an injustice to the way we relate to each other, to our capacity to see other people as ends and not just as means. And the third concern flowing from these first two, is that it's hard to make sense of all the counterexamples we have in our social life which, in which people make enormous sacrifices for each other, in which people pursue all sorts of goals which would appear to be irrational from the point of this kind of rational choice Marxism. And therefore, the theory, as a theory, does what no scientific theory ought to do, which is just ignores counterexamples, and hence becomes a kind of a rigid doctrine. So if you are a materialist, are you guilty of these three sins which the critics lay out? So let me go through them point by point and show that how the worries, while legitimate, are nevertheless unfounded. Let's start with the question of motivation. Is it the case that a materialist account of agency reduces all motivation to the economic? The answer is no. So how is it possible that it does not reduce all mo motivation to the economic if, in fact, it's saying that in our analysis we prioritize or we assume that workers, capitalists, are materially motivated? We can, in fact, allow that people are motivated by all sorts of goals, by all sorts of values, moral ones, aesthetic ones, uh, religious ones, all of these. The point is not that people don't have other motivations or other goals. The point is that in order to pursue those goals, they have to be first economically viable. In order to be a successful artist, I have to first earn a living. In order to pursue my religious ends, I have to be able to, to keep body and soul, uh, mind and body together. In order to uh, have a successful arrangement in my social affairs, I have to make sure I have bread and water every day. It is not that we don't value anything else. It's that there is no other value which acts as a precondition for satisfying higher order values. So what the economic motivation does is that it constitutes the practical precondition for pursuing whatever other goals you might have. Now, this has an interesting implication. 
We pursue all sorts of social interactions every day in our lives. We have friendships, we have love affairs, we go to work every day, we have our political goals. It is not the case that the economic motivation will weigh equally in all of these. The prediction is this, that in those spheres of our social activity, where our engagements and social interactions impinge directly on our material well-being, the economic motivation will, will be uh, the, the most important. What are these engagements? Well, the first one, of course, is our livelihood. And what is our livelihood determined by, governed by? Our place in the class structure. Our place in the class structure determines what sort of strategy we have to pursue in order to maintain our physical well-being, our economic well-being. It is no surprise, then, that when considering how capitalism works as an economy, the assumption of rationality works the best, because the assumption of rationality is what allows us to successfully reproduce ourselves in the class structure. Now, as you move away from your practice in the class structure into your social friendships, into your love relations, into your moral and aesthetic affairs, there's a lot more contingency in uh, how your motivations are, are played out and what courses of action you're going to pursue. So the reason Marxism puts economic interests at the center of its conception of agency is not because it thinks agents are always and everywhere economically motivated. It's that it is examining a domain of social existence where economic considerations reign supreme, which is our economic reproduction, how we reproduce ourselves economically, and the power relations within the economy that enable class actors to successfully pursue an exploitative agenda or resist that exploitative agenda. Marxism is not a theory of friendship. It is a theory of class and class reproduction. And that's why the materialism is an important consideration. It does not have as much to say about non-economic, non-political, purely ideological, purely symbolic phenomena. Therefore, it's a mistake to think that the assumption of rationality is exhaustively describing human motivations. It's simply describing how humans are motivated in those domains that the theory has taken up as being central as its object of inquiry. All right, so suppose we can say that human beings will be try to uphold their economic well-being, their physical well-being, in the class situation where they find themselves. Now the second concern, must they be maximizers? Must they be constantly trying to get the most out of, out of every interaction? The answer again is no. What you should look at the uh, economic motivation as being is a uh, uh, kind of a precondition for everything else and therefore a floor on how much sacrifice they're willing to make for their aesthetic, amorous, or friendship, uh, 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 the, the uh, social interactions and engagements that they have. Human beings are perfectly, it is perfectly consistent with materialism for people to say, I'm happy with enough. I'm happy with making just enough and not the maximum that I can make. But that just enough cannot fall beneath a certain floor. So I don't have to be somebody who is a rational choice theories rational maximizer. I, have, I just have to be what rational choice theorists call satisficers. As long as I can satisfy my basic needs, it's perfectly consistent with materialism without imposing on top of that the, the demand that I be maximizing my economic needs as well. Now, this is important because it, it is what reveals to us the fact that many workers will give up raising their wages beyond to the maximum point or making, finding a job that is the highest paying in favor of jobs or pay scales that allow them to pursue other ends as long as they can still be physically viable and able to sustain their families and support their families. There's nothing inconsistent in being a materialist and eschewing or rejecting a maximizing doctrine for whatever it is that you think workers are pursuing. Now finally, is it the case that everybody always, uh, always is pursuing material ends? The answer is no. We all know examples of people who make enormous sacrifices in their class reproduction. We all know instance, instances of capitalists who will forego profits for some of their uh, moral ends. We all know instances of proletarianizing peasants 
who fight tooth and nail and indeed might even sacrifice themselves because they will not take up wage labor because they find it either morally offensive or degrading for themselves. We all know those instances. The point is not whether such instances exist. The point is whether they're outliers. What social theory does, it does not try to, it, it, social theory is not an, a theory of every individual person in society. It is a theory of aggregates. It is what we call social facts. So the first thing of theory has to do is see what is typical versus what is exceptional. What a class structure does is not univocally, unilaterally impose one strategy on everybody who's in the class situation. What it does is it puts into place the gradient, as it were, the amount of the kind of cost you have to internalize if you ignore the dictates of the class structure, what the structure is demanding of you. Some people will be willing to undertake enormous costs to ignore what their class position is telling them. There are workers who will not do what the boss tells them. There are workers who will not take up, or peasants who will not take up wage labor once they've lost their land, and they might even sacrifice themselves. But we, as we all know, those are exceptions. And we know they're exceptions because we have names for those sorts of activities. We, we have a different category for them. The first task in social theory is to say, what is a typical response to a certain social situation? And then you see whether the counterexamples have tremendous social weight or whether they are more isolated instances. I'll give you an example for political for organizing. The materialist view says most workers will pursue individual courses of action against collective ones because they see the level of risk and cost that's associated with trying to organize a union when they'll get fired if they ever get discovered. So they put their head down, they do their work, and they find what James Scott calls weapons of the weak, ways of expressing their dissent while keeping their job. But we also know there's workers who undertake enormous risks to organize their comrades. Now, those workers are ignoring important signals that come out of the class structure. What's prudent to do, what's rational to do, what's reasonable to do. They do what's unreasonable. They do what's irrational. We have a word for them. They're fanatics. As Chomsky says, organizers tend to be the ones who are the exceptions to what everyone else is doing. And it is a foolhardy organizer who thinks other workers think like him. Every successful organizer knows that their particular orientation is unusual. So they don't just go walk up to other workers and say, I expect you to commit enormous sacrifices, undertake all the risks that are imaginable, and I expect you, like me, to subordinate every aspect of your life to organizing. The challenge for them is to get workers to join their organization knowing that they are not like them. Well, that's proof that these deviations from the norm, these organizers, understand themselves that they are an exception. And therefore, we cannot build that orientation into our conception of agency. Agency has to look at what the typical response to the class structure is and then try to explain where the patho pathological cases, the deviations, come from. It is in, therefore entirely consistent with the materialist view to find counterexamples. But first, we see, recognize them as being outliers and exceptions rather than the norm. Then we try to explain what generates those exceptions, whether it's exceptional circumstances that generate the exceptions, or whether those exceptions are themselves an enduring social fact. If it is an enduring social fact, now your theory has a problem. But if it's small numbers of people who ignore the dictates of the class structure, it means that the vast majority are following the dictates of the class structure. And that's what social theory is trying to explain, why most people do what they do in typical situations. All right, so if this is the case, then, we can say that the, these three objections, there may be other ones, but these three objections, which are the most common ones, are not actually devastating to the theory. And indeed, we can now present a positive account of how, given our description of social agency, how class relations and social relations in the writ large are reproduced. And it, you know, it, it goes something like this, that unlike the, the accusation that we reduce everybody to a, uh, that we reduce all motivations to economic motivations, that we insist that people are maximizers, that we don't account or allow for deviations, here's what we can say. 
People in capitalism value many things. They have very many motivations. They all try to do the right thing. They try to be moral agents. But in conditions of scarcity, and indeed in capitalism, conditions of generalized insecurity, which is what capitalism imposes on the vast majority of the population. In these conditions of generalized insecurity, on top of the scarcity that is characteristic of modern society, despite their many motivations, despite their many different valuations of what's the, what the good is, people everywhere and always have to, in the first instance, subordinate their other goals and their other motivations to their economic viability, to their material reproduction, to their physical well-being. And indeed, insofar as they have to subordinate their other goals to these physical needs, this is the basis of Marx's critique of capitalism. It is not that Marx insists that people everywhere are just economic animals. In fact, his critique, his denunciation of capitalism is that it reduces people to prioritizing the economic above all else in their everyday relations. He doesn't promote the idea that people are just economic animals. He condemns the fact that they are reduced to being economic animals. Why can he condemn it? Because his conception of human agent is multidimensional. It is even though human beings value autonomy, they willingly give up their autonomy in order to have work. And so for 8, 10, 12 hours a day, they subordinate their will to somebody else. Even though people value artistic expression, they are not able to pursue it because they're working 12, 14, 16 hours a day. Marx says the whole reason he pushes for socialism is that it will, by granting people economic security, by granting them economic rights, it will enable them to pursue all of those other ends which class society suppresses. Now, this is Marx, who's a materialist, saying this. It therefore makes no sense to insist that materialism reduces people to economic animals. It is capitalism that reduces them to economic animals. And what materialist theory does is it answers the question, why do they subordinate themselves to these dictates of the class structure? It is an empirical observation. It is not a a priori ontological assumption about the nature of agency. OK, so first of all, we can allow for the fact that people are motivated by, by very many things. A second, I think, virtue of this approach to social agency is that it, it allows us to explain how capitalism spread across the world into so many different cultures. Capitalism spreads not only into very many different cultures, but it sustains the heterogeneity of cultures across the world. How might it be able to do that? It does so precisely because people value their culture probably above everything else. But even though they value their culture above everything else, when they're forced into a new position of being proletarians, of being wage laborers, they have no choice but to submit to it. They submit to it only as far as they have to. Remember, it's a practical choice. So those aspects of their norms, of their religion, of their values, which conflict with the economic imperative of having to make a life, they will either ignore or they'll overturn. This gives us a theory of cultural change, which culturalists simply don't have. There is no theory of cultural change in cultural theory. <laughs> I should say culturalist cultural theory. You explain cultural change by relying on the materialist premise that people reflect on their values, they reflect on their norms, and then they literally either actively choose those norms which are appropriate for their situation, or more passively, they reject the ones which are interfering with their economic goals and economic imperatives. What this means then is, what Marxism commits you to is the view that cultures transform as people's economic constraints change. But those parts of the culture that have no bearing on economic reproduction, there's no pressure for them to change through the class structure. They might change for other reasons. But if this is so, notice what it means. It means that regardless of culture, as capitalism enters, newly proletarianized wage laborers will have to, whatever their ideas, whatever their culture tells them, they'll have to submit to the logic of wage labor. And those aspects of the culture that interfere with it will be put to the test. They'll either be ignored or they'll be changed. Those aspects of the culture that are neutral, 
or have no connection to class will persist, which means there are many, many aspects of, say, Indian culture or Middle Eastern culture, which will not be changed by capitalism. This is perfectly consistent with our theory. The Bayes structure of Bharti goes through all kinds of circumlocutions to be able to explain where, how capitalism is able to globalize if people are constituted by their culture. He makes, I think, a rather tortured distinction between the globalization of capital and its universalization. He said capitalism's globalized, but it hasn't universalized. What does that even mean? <laughs> well, for him, what it means is it's globalized, but it hasn't done what it's supposed to do. That's what universalization would mean. But what is it supposed to do? It's supposed to make every aspect of culture re a reflex or subordinated to the logic of capital. Well, that's an impossible task. It's never happened in the West, much less the East. There's plenty of cultural diversity in the West. This theory, on the other hand, says it's perfectly consistent with the theory that there is lots and lots of culture that is not subject to the logic of capital. It might be, but the theory doesn't demand it. Finally, it has the, uh, the virtue of giving us a means for uniting people across cultures, across nations, so that politics doesn't descend into the endless particularisms that we've seen overtake it over the past 20 25 years. Identity politics, the caste politics, the religious politics. There is now, the way the bourgeois world is going, what we have passing for politics is simply tribalism. This is true in India. This is true in the United States. It's increasingly true in Europe. Every, <laughs> Shivanandan once beautifully said, the editor in Race and Class, every shard of the self becomes a political movement. Every social identity demands that that identity become the primary one, that that identity defend itself against all others. And this calls itself radicalism. There's nothing radical about it. There is no radicalism without a universal anti-capitalism. Every single advance that was made over the 20th century, not just with respect to redistribution and class, but race relations and gender relations, came out of an engagement with capital, its state across individual identities for those, those bonds, those interests that unite people across the identities. There is no other axis that I know of that can help overcome the tribalism that neoliberalism has imposed upon us except class, except our economic connections. A materialist Social theory is the first, the most important anchor for a return to that politics. And if we don't return there, I see no way out. What we are living through the worst period since the birth of the modern left. We are intellectually the weakest we've ever been on the left. Politically, we are utterly disorganized. And all politics has now become the politics organized around individualism, individual goals, individual agency and individual traumas. So everything's a trauma. The only way out of this is we go back to our roots. I should have called this talk, instead of the flight from materialism, I should have called it the road back. <laughs> we need to find a road back to a politics that unites the oppressed and the exploited rather than pitting them against each other. And there is no way to do it without a return to materialism. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vivek, for that absolutely important lecture. I, I, I don't think I can really...